Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me today. We're talking to Laura Clear. She told me how to pronounce it. I still got it wrong. (laughs) We're talking to Laura Clear today. She's an educator turned caregiver like many people. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So you also have created a series of books that you call Nana's Books. But before we get into that, tell us how you ended up becoming a caregiver. Well, um, my mother-in-law was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia probably in somewhere around 2014. And I've kind of pieced that together now. And she was in a regular assisted living and was moved up to the memory care floor closer to just before COVID hit. So I would say we were, my husband's the youngest of six and we were, you know, we live out of state, but yet we would go up all the time. And it was just really all new to us. So that was our intro to this world, right? That's that's how we became accustomed to this new life. With was was there like an emergency or um, what what triggered her moving to the memory care part of well, the residence? I'd say the sentinel event for her was a fall, and it was you know on the heels of, of other falls, but initially we didn't know what that meant. Um, because you don't know, um, now, now I do, uh, and on the job training. Right. So that was kind of the beginning. And then she was doing things like cracking up the car in minor ways and leaving the kettle on and, uh, you know, just general, not disarray, but kind of entropy within the house and things kind of got away from her. And we could just tell that she really wasn't, and there wasn't much in the fridge. She just wasn't herself and she wasn't participating in, let's say her bridge group or reading the way she was and leaving her newspapers, you know, wrapped up on the dining room table. So we could kind of tell that she was needing more support and needed to be in an environment where she'd be safe. Hence the move less than a mile away from her home to a great assisted living. And that went well for a time. And then over time with UTIs and falls, she ended up in the ER on a number of occasions and therefore she moved up to the third floor, which is the memory care floor. Of, so of did her. she did she go willingly to the assisted living or was that a sort of kicking and screaming <laughs> type uh, of event? <laughs> no, you know what? I, I think she's unique in that it was somewhat willing. I think she was almost relieved. She, you know had such a large family was at the helm of this family, six kids and, you know, many, many, I think 14 grandchildren for 60 plus years. So for her, my father-in-law had passed, you know, a number of years prior, uh, five or six years prior. And I think that she was ready and almost relieved and she's social. So that, that ended things were not very challenging uh, to get her to quote unquote, get her to go. Um, And when she was there, she thrived initially. She was hydrated and she was, you know, looking great and she was eating well and she was participating in things and enjoying, you know, the Jerry Vale singer that comes (laughs) and uh, different, you know, activities. They'd arrange flowers and they'd go on little outings around the community. They'd go to the Loring Cinema in a little tiny theater in Hingham or they'd go and have a burger at Wahlburgers um, in the Hingham shipyard. And, you know, I think for her, there was a period of time there and she had lots of visitors. My sister-in-law, Denise, was kind of, um, who lives nearby, was on the, you know, boots on the ground with her care and was amazing. And she really kept everything flowing nicely. She had visitors and initially things were going very well. And then COVID hit. Mm, COVID. That wrecked a lot of good things. But it? it's it's important to know that, and I and we need to share this message But, you know, an assisted living community is not someplace you go to warehouse yourself till you die. You know, like you said, she looked better. She was more, you know, she had more social opportunities, which we know is super important for our cognitive health. And it sounds like she was tired. She was tired of being the matriarch in charge of this large family. She really was. Yeah. And, And she probably didn't admit it to herself. 
no, no. She, she was like a really stoic person who did her thing. She had a very wicked, like a dry sense of humor, humor and, and was very fun to be around and never really let anybody um, feel as though she was as, you know, beat possibly as exhausted as she, she probably was. Yeah. Life is tiring. <laughs> yeah. So, so for her, I think it was, you know, a, a transition that, you know, for many is harder and for her was perhaps a relief. And about how old was she when she moved to the assisted living? Um, I would say 74, 74. Okay. Cause I, I have a tendency to talk to people about, you know, when you get into your eighties, why in God's name would you want to try and maintain a single family home? You know, I don't know. You're in Connecticut, so I don't much tidier state than California for sure. Right, right. But if you cannot drive, you aren't getting to the grocery store or the doctor or the hair salon or any of the normal things that life requires, right? Right, right. And if your neighbors don't come over regularly, like my mom lived in a, a typical residential neighborhood. She lived across the street from the school. So in the almost 47 years they were there, you know, it was brand new neighborhood. So it had young families. We all grew up and moved away. And I, th I think they must've been on the third round of families, but it wasn't like a community of older, like where I live is fairly variety. It's a, a variety of, of ages and generations, but it leans to pre-retirement and retired folks. Mm. And, you know, if you don't have somebody that can pop in and check on you, you know, your social life gets smaller. Right. You've got right. the stresses of maintaining house. Why wouldn't you want to go to assisted living where they do the cooking, the cleaning, a right. lot of the manager medications, they've got a bus, you know, a little van bus to take you places. They make, they plan activities. You got other people in your stage of life to socialize with or not, you know, it's just like, ugh, just I like it. when right. we were buying our house, my husband told, the broker that we worked with that this was our last home until we died or had to move to assisted living. And he came to that decision slowly. I've been kind of beating him over the head with it, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, there's a lot of work to do to take care of a house. And I think we need to acknowledge that, you know, at some point let's let somebody else do that. Yeah. So I'm exactly. glad you're, I'm glad your mother-in-law realized that. And, and that, you know, without, without a big fuss, because most people don't do it willingly and that's unfortunate. So how did you come about creating this series of books you're calling Nana's books and, um, well, just tell us about them. <laughs> so I misspoke before she was closer to 84. I don't know. Why okay. I um, but Math. I, now, that I'm, now that I, um, am thinking about it, I'm like, well, you know what? Um, yes, eight closer to 84, um, because she was married for 60 years. So I'm, I'm doing the math, but yeah. So, um, so what happened was, is that we would go and visit and I have twins who at the time were probably 11 or 12 and they'd bring their cell phones and scroll through their phones and show her pictures of what was going on in their lives. And she loved that. And we would do zoom calls with her. She loved that. And we really were at a loss for conversation with her and with Louis body dementia. Some of the stuff that she was starting to talk about was taking her to a dark place. And kind of my kids were you know, thinking, whoa, you know, what is this about? So I thought, all right, well, she loved the Boston Globe. She loved the Patriot Ledger. She loved her Mary Higgins Clark. Um, how could we give her something that's not quite that difficult, yet not the board books and the word searches and the things that were available? There were a couple of old good housekeeping magazines that were there and no, no selection of any kind. And this was a wonderful place. And I thought, we've got to do better than this. Maybe I could make something that we could bring. So it was purely um, me trying to create something for, you know, for her. And, and that was really it. I didn't think I was going to do anything more with it than that. <laughs> and it was very custom uh, to accommodate her needs as well as to pique her interest and to give her something. I knew as a teacher that high interest materials are most important. P people need to self-select. So I needed to do more than one book so she could have, let's say, two to choose from or three to choose from so she could feel like she had a little bit of autonomy. Uh, there were so many things that went into it that I just 
started to, like I said, my older sister tells me, Christy, she says, your teacher brain went on. So it did. <laughs> and I started to think about, well, now how do I activate her past and her prior schema and the things that she knew and loved? How do I bring in auditory cueing uh, poetry? How do I bring in visual cueing, these great images? How do I bring in art and literature and things that really give people uh, the story of humanity, the story of all of our lives, the common themes that we all share. So it kind of evolved. Nana's books kind of evolved that way. And they were for Nana, who was, we all called her Nana. I say in-laws, outlaws, her kids, her grandkids, everyone called her Nana. And um, I, I really, that's, it was, it was that simple. That was the genesis of the whole thing. <laughs> Although that's not terribly simple. It's just, it came from the heart. So it felt right. sort of simple. Right. I had a na- I had a nana too. My paternal grandmother, when my I'm the oldest grandkid on both sides. So when my mom was expecting me, she declared that she was not old enough to be called grandma, even though my <laughs> maternal grandmother was younger. So we had a nana and a grandma, and she passed away at 103. So there's yeah. a lot of life and history and interesting stories that thankfully I managed to capture some of them in the last few months of her life. Thank goodness for cell phones with voice recorders. And I had a lapel mic that plugged into the bottom of my phone so that when she spoke, she didn't have to, you know, she could just speak at her normal volume, which was, you know, as we age, it gets quieter. And she was, this was in the fall of 2020, 2020, and she passed away April 21. So it's like those two last couple of years have been a lot. Right. So describe the first couple of books that you created specifically for your Nana and how that evolved into books for everybody's Nanas and grandpas and papas and whatever we call them. Well, you know, I see that you with your photography and you were chronicling your Nana, um, you know, you reached back to gifts that you had and past uh, iterations of your careers and things like that. So that's kind of what I did. So what the first two books of mine were initially, I did one uh, called Life's Journeys, and it is all a poetry paired with, but the real, real classics like Robert Frost, things that had just come into the public domain. Um, and I really, really was careful about vetting what I used and the art so that it's nostalgic and it it, it gives people joy and it gives people vistas into nature and you know, the past and, and real positive memories, but also that it's available, you know, for use, uh, you know, fair use. Uh, so that was tricky. And I, you know, did that, but again, I wasn't thinking those terms when I created that first one, but somehow in the back of my mind, I thought I want to do this right. So I did that. Um, and the first one had poems about, um, you know, the road less traveled and things that had to do with bringing home baby and first loves and the bittersweet passages of life and all of that. So that was life's journeys. Um, that I started a poetry series called sit with me at sundown. And that one was called nostalgic poetry for the young at heart. Others followed like devotional poetry for the young at heart, uh, which has to do with, you know, daily affirmations and Psalms and, and things of that nature, hymns and so forth. Um, and then the second book, which I, I think is one of my favorite, if not my favorite in the series, she grew up in South Boston and she was, um, you know, the very, very heavy duty Irish community. And she loved all of that, the wit and wisdom of Ireland and the witticisms. She had a lot of expressions and things like that. And she lived in this neighborhood that was really, really mostly immigrants. And they uh, just found joy in the every day and still do. My son lives there now. Um, he's out of college and he lives in Southie. So we've come full circle as a family. Uh, <laughs> I have nieces and nephews that also live right within his neighborhood. So they've all gravitated back to their roots on that side of the family, back to Southie. So a lot of the uh, witticisms um, and the the sharp humor about Ireland and, and about the Irish um, sensibilities and and you know, looking at life in a way where you can find hope and you can find humor in the everyday. So, so those are the two books and that's kind of how I started with, you know, with, with them. And again, expressly for her. That must've been a fun labor of love. 
Oh, I love it. I absolutely <laughs> love it. I still love it. I just did a book um, recently that is getting a lot of press. I haven't promoted anything, but now it's uh, becoming, people are becoming aware of it. Uh, it's called Love is Love. And it's a book because I realized that there is nothing for many populations, but the LGBTQ population is our, among our most underserved and most overrepresented when it comes to loneliness and isolation during the pandemic. So I took old love poems and old, very, very old photographs that are just beautiful of same-sex couples so people could see themselves. The representation is there and the affirmation and that identity um, preserving peace is, is there. So people are loving that. And I think they're like, wow, this did not exist. And this makes me feel great. And I feel connected and I feel seen. That's so awesome. That's my most recent, uh, one of my most recent books. And I've got another one that's coming out. Um, that's out. Um, and has a big splash for that is coming out May 3rd. So I'm giving you a little pre conversation. Um, but one that's coming out is called Never mind the puppy in my purse. And there are all these funny pictures with dogs and people and these funny situations. Um, and that was inspired by a woman um, that just passed away, Linda, whose uh, da daughter is a millennial caregiver, uh, Miss Patty Cake, uh, who's out. Oh, yeah, I know the them. North, Northwest. And I've sent her a number of books over the years. And uh, she'd say, do, 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 do. And she would touch all the different images when I'd send books with babies and so forth. And I just didn't get it finished in time. Uh, never mind the puppy in my purse for Linda. Um, and, you know, I really feel for, you know, Patty, she's was such an amazing carer. There are so many people like her out there and she's a millennial and that are digging deep and, and creating these wonderful memories and, and giving these wonderful send offs and end of life person centered care to their loved ones and their family members. It's, it, it's, and, and friends, it's, it's wonderful to see. So Definitely. I'm just trying to put tools together, you know, and give people things that are high interest that they, that they really, that resonate with them. Well, I have one of Linda's artwork. Um, I don't have it hung up in my office yet. We've only been here four and a half months. So, and no. I, I'm not sure when it came. It took two tries. I think the mailman is appreciating the, um, the <laughs> mail carrier is appreciating the first one that she shipped to me because it never came. <laughs> we don't know where it went, but just, just kind of a funny aside. I live in the town of Auburn, California, and she lives in Auburn, Washington. So Washington. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of funny because same name, different state, but yeah, no, they, I, I will link, um, Patty's Instagram handle in the show notes so that people can go find it if they're not following it, but don't mind the puppy in my purse. That would have been something my mom loved because as many people know, my mom had her repetitive story was triggered by her dog that she had with her in memory care for half the time she lived there or a stuffed dog. But she would start talking about how, you know, when she was pregnant with her oldest, which was me, her mother-in-law, which was my Nana, said, well, now that you're expecting a child, you're going to be getting rid of the dogs, right? And apparently that pissed my mom off so bad that that <laughs> is the story. She told that story so often that her friend in memory care could repeat it. And one time, you know, my mom launched into the story and and the other Diane, because my mom was one of three Dianes, if, as if that's not confusing enough, and the other Diane said, you've told me that story 803 times, which made me laugh because I thought, man, that was a very specific number and probably true. So my, you know, so my mom would have loved that book. So where did you get, like, tell us about the photographs that are in that book. And if you have it handy, you can show it for the people who like to watch this on, on YouTube, but most people listen. So well, as I said, never mind the puppy in my purse is in production, but the pictures are, again, really inspired by Miss Patty Cake's love of her joy for all pets puppy and um, popcorn, I believe that she'd carry mm -hmm. around with her and that she enjoyed so much. And I thought I've got to get this together because um, when they got back from Disney, um, you know, Linda's health took a, you know, took a dip and, and, but again, I, I couldn't do it fast enough. So I do regret that. Um, but again, the pictures are, black and white photographs that are kind of sepia toned, uh, but real vintage and that are just really comical situations that I think 
resonate with people. And I think that like your mom with the story that she told, p- people with aphasia rely on these old saws. It's almost like it's a safe thing. It's a comforting thing. They go back and back and back to it. It's kind of like they have that moment and they're, you know, I often talk about my grandfather who grew up in old Manhattan and um, the stories he would tell about his childhood um, where, they, you know, he was the child of, of an immigrant from Italy. And his dad came here with $11 um, from Barry, Italy by himself and was on the Lower East Side in the Bowery and how he evolved and ended up on Beekman Place and um, was an ice man and hauled ice to businesses all over the in the city to restaurants and hotels and things like that. So my grandfather was extremely physical, extremely smart. Um, and his stories that he would talk about the, the different vendors and the restaurateurs and the people in the neighborhood, those are the things, Jen, that he would lean into and talk about kind of like, so you, you draw from your experience and the things that make you feel uh, you know, relevant and and seen and heard. And and I think that my grandfather would tell, you know, and he did he did not have dementia. Um, but like, you know, uh, your mom, we, we all have our little jewel boxes within us that we dip into when we're feeling, you know, sad or lonely or insecure. It's it's a self-soothing type of a thing. So just the act of saying it out loud and having somebody listen to you, that's really beautiful because it gives you that moment where you feel that you are again in the mix and that you're part of the human community. And I think that dementia, you, you become other and you, you know, which is so sad and it shouldn't be, and you become, you know, marginalized in in some ways because you don't have the ability to advocate for yourself and to uh, you know, in, interact the way it used to. My mother-in-law played bridge for many years, Penny Bridge, and they'd br- all bring a little lunch, a brown paper bag, and they br- they'd brown bag very down to earth. And eventually she stopped getting asked because she, and she would walk with other women friends. And, you know, that lasted a bit longer than the bridge because the bridge is so cognitive, right? Um, and requires so much higher level thinking. Um, but I do think that she mourned that and she was aware of that. They did it very delicately, but I, I really believe that it, um, that call to story and that call to company and be being among people, I think when that goes away, it's such a loss. And there are so many losses. I call it a, um, a symphony of losses, right? You lose your driver's license. You lose the autonomy to run to the market and to do the things you want to do. Um, people make decisions for you. Perhaps you move out of your family home. You lose your husband or your wife or, you know, your, your person, Right. So I do think that if you can give people that ability to have a connection, even if it's momentary, you know, momentarily or or just a, a brief glimmer of who you are and you're able to express that and share that, that's all we're here for, in my opinion, you know, in my view. I, f- I feel like we're here to, you know, as Ram Das says, walk, we're just here to, we're just walking each other home. That makes sense. And it's, yeah. I like the way you put, well, I like the little jewel box of, you know, connections that we dip into. That's, that's a really lovely way of putting it, but understanding that the repetitive stories have a meaning that nobody's ever articulated it as you just did. And I think that's really helpful to know. I would, because I did not need to hear the story a thousand times and she did actually bring the story up in front of my grandmother, my Nana. (laughs) <laughs> which a little embarrassing, a uh, little awkward. So I learned to, when she started in on the story, I would ask her questions about, cause the story always started with, I've had dogs all my life and da, 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 da. So as right, soon right. as she, well, that I can always tell there was always a physical, I always referred to it as the wind up. There's always a physical cue that she was about to launch into that story. And so then I could be prepared with, Oh, really? That's right. What were their names? Mm -hmm. And so the one time I asked her, I actually recorded this and she said, well, the first one was named Misty. That was the last one. And we liked that name so much. We just used it on all the dogs, which was complete baloney. (laughs) (laughs) But it was like, I thought that's a really interesting, you know, like, where is like, I don't want to say where is her brain? I knew where it kind of was, but I thought that's a really interesting way that to articulate it because 
I wondered if she'd remember some of the older dogs from like before I was born or when I was, you know, tiny, <clears throat> excuse me. And so it was interesting that she just manifested the one dog's name and applied it to all the previous dogs. Right, right. You know, but it it allowed her to have that conversation without me wanting to run screaming into the street. We were at the dog park. I would take my it was very difficult to find activities that my mom was comfortable participating in. Right. Because she her visual processing was terrible. And she was always worried she was going to do something wrong or, or it just, the whole thing was 10 times more stressful than just not doing it. So right, I right. would take her out and one, so this was right before Thanksgiving, 2019, we went to the dog park with my three golden retrievers, which between three golden retrievers and my mom is a lot. <laughs> and brave you're a brave woman. Yeah. Well, I, I actually used to take her and one of the Dianes out to a regional park. And, or to the nail salon. And people thought I was insane. Like, it's just you and two women with Alzheimer's. It's like, yeah, but they talk to each other. I think and that's they in, It's great. They interacted with each yeah. other. So it was it was a, a better visit. I got them both out. In you know, a lot of times we'd go out into, you know, nature and sunlight and fresh air. And, you know, they would basically shoot the breeze about the same thing over and over again. And I could just listen. I could answer an email on my phone. I could just put my head back and, and let the sun touch my face, although I'm super pale. So that's always a dangerous thing to do for long. And, you know, it was really actually easier and they appreciated getting out so, uh, so much that, you know, just, it gave me joy that they were, they were so happy, but yeah, we went to the, the dog park. She was launched, you know, obviously that was a trigger to launch into the story, but it was interesting how my dogs also, um, we're really good with her. Like the youngest one, let's see, that was um, two and a half years ago. So he was like two and a half. Thank God I can do that math this morning. <laughs> and I needed an extra hand, like all of us, except for the dogs, the two of us needed to use the restroom. So I had to like corral the four of them out of the dog park and down the walkway and back to my car and, you know, that's tricky enough with mom, but with the three dogs, it was, it was a lot. And she had the youngest one on his leash and they were walking and they approached a pole that, you know, like stick it in the middle of the, it was like a divider kind of thing. And he went right, she went left and she just naturally lifted the leash up and over the pole. And cause I was watching them cause I thought, uh Oh, we're going to have a we're going to have a collision with that pole. And they just, they both, he looked at her and she looked at him and I'm like, this is amazing. This connection these two are having. Yeah. And, oh, it's amazing. I've worked yeah. in, in, with, um, you know, uh, in equine assisted therapy for people with, that are living with dementia here in old Lyme at, um, I consulted with a group here called high hopes therapeutic riding. They're amazing. And they've been around since the seventies and now, now they're branching into, they, you know, work with children with a developmental, um, physical, you know, uh, compromising, you know, disabilities and, and challenges. And now they're working with people that are living with dementia because it's the same idea. It, it really, the connection is, is so powerful. And uh, another organization here, uh, the next step, uh, which is for people that are in transition, people that are veterans or that have PTSD or that are, um, you know, moms or fam you know, families that are in, in crisis or in transition. So these groups are use utilizing animal therapy because animals are so wise and they know and the connection is so deep. So I am so with you on that. You know, but getting back to what you were saying about your mom and her stories about how she uh, conflated all the dogs' names into one, Honestly, Jen, I, I think about this a lot. Confabulation and embroidering a story or doing something like that is really fantastic because I always say I see the fabulous in confabulation and it is fabulous. And I'll tell you why. It gives you a window into your mom's or my Nana, you know, my mother-in-law's psyche because the place where they, let's say they have lapses in memory and they add and they subtract and they exaggerate or they, you know, change something or, you know, a lot of it's not even con conscious. 
Um, they're not doing so much with the meta, you know, the metacognition and all that thinking about their thinking. They're just putting it out there. So the interesting thing is you can say to yourself, aha, what does that, it represents an unmet need and something that they want to be affirmed in. So it's like, um, I have a woman who, you know, we used to talk all the time about how she was in beauty pageants. And I think she was in it at like a state level or something, but she'd talk about Bess Meyerson, who was a beauty pageant, you know, a beauty queen in those days. And she would talk about, you know, they'd see each other in the dressing rooms and all this stuff, purely fantasy, a lot of it, but it, it gave me the sense to know that, Hey, this is important to her. She felt like a big shot for a little bit. And she's now kind of, you know, uh, ramping it up and, and, and kind of giving it more oomph than it had. And again, it's harmless. It's something that we do to, um, again, feel relevant, feel, uh, feel seen. So I think your mom giving all the dogs, the names and whatever, perhaps that wasn't the same name, wasn't what happened exactly, but in her mind's eye, that is now part of her, her little, you know, um, you know, her story and her lexicon and, 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 you know, her history. So I, I think that's really cool. And I think the more we observe what we're being told and what we, you know, what we can see and what, what we're taking in with, you know, our elders and our loved ones, we can use that information for the good. I think we've got to pay attention. I've got a friend um, who is, will be 87 in August. And she tells me all the time, she says, when something happens, a bad thing or a rejection or something happens, she says to me, Lori, pay attention. Like that wasn't meant for you or that wasn't, you know, your path. So things will present themselves to you as they should and pay attention. So I think working with people with dementia, the most important thing I, I think is that we pay attention. I agree. And it, it helped instead of hearing the story for the umpteenth time and literally wanting to scream, Stop asking her, you know, she, I've had dogs all my life. And I'm like, oh, that's right. It it gave us a, a minute, a few minutes, not very many, but a, a handful of minutes to have a conversation. It didn't right. matter that none of the dogs were, you know, none of the other dogs were named Misty. I think I asked her how they came up with that name. I don't remember. I, she may not have actually answered because I don't remember what the answer was. Um, and then I asked her something about. Um, were the boy dogs also named Misty? Cause they had one named Pierre, which right. he was a fascinating dog. That dog could find balls in the bottom of a pond in a place he'd never been. And so I asked her about him. That didn't seem to trigger too many memories, but it did give us a time to like have a conversation mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of me just nodding along. Like, uh huh. Yeah. You're, you're, right. you're, you're, you know, and just, and I think she would have sensed, I know she would have sensed my, like my irritation with hearing the same story again. Right. Because, right. you know, it, it also reiterated that she didn't remember our relationship. She always thought I was her best friend, which I was totally fine with. Right. But some, sometimes it got to the point where it's like, you know, I couldn't acknowledge my dad with her because it was always her husband. So that sometimes was tough. And then, you know, I always had to pretend to be her best friend, right. which that was less difficult. So you know, it just, it does help. And it's nice that you've got books that help people with these conversations. So I know you have one that's got all kinds of pictures with, you know, their, their vintage photos, maybe you want to even say antique mm -hmm. with, yes. um, girls and their dolls, right? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day. And you know your time is worth more than three bucks. 
Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. Yes. Yes. I love that. And, and that's just like you're saying your mom with the dog. So the dogs were her invitation. So when you take her to the dog park, which I think is lovely um, with her friend, which is now because of COVID now nursing homes, because people couldn't get in family members, could, you know, um, were locked out the now the reliance on their peers and, and getting to know their peers, nursing homes and um, assisted livings and long-term care places are realizing the power of those relationships. So that, as I getting back to the invitations, the invitation of the book, um, Living Dolls, uh, a picture book of, nostalgic picture book of Living Dolls. The My theory behind that is that it doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity, your socioeconomic background, your level of education, uh, your, where you're from geographically, any of those things. The instinct to love on a doll and to love and nurture is universal and it's global. And I feel like those black and white pictures that I came up with and I put them together, uh, you know, I say, oh, well, anybody could have done that. And that's true. But because I took the time to do it, because I feel like it's important, it has generated, it helps generate, it's generative, it generates conversation, but it's generated these responses from people. And I'll tell you what I found fascinating was that people, male and female that see these books, and there are males in the book, there are females, there are people, you know, there are children that have handicapping conditions from way, way back and different types of wheelchairs and, you know, with polio and walkers and just different types of settings and under the Christmas tree and just so many things that are so evocative to all of us of our past, right? So I think that it gives people the opportunity to look at these pictures and really get a sense that we're all united it, you know, in the story of life and nothing is a greater leveler than dementia because none of those things I mentioned before that are quote unquote, our diversity, right? This is about our unity. And this is what unifies us is this challenge that comes along and that just brings, you know, families to their knees and what is joyful, what is memorable, what is sweet, what is, uh, you know, gives you a sense of that you're a part of something and that your life matters is that just instinct to love. And I love the different, you know, the poses and the varieties of, you know, the outfits and the the eras, and we're talking about Victorian pe people in Victorian times, and you know, just across the ages. And I think what's so interesting is that a lot of people say the same thing: oh, "I had shoes like that," or there are a lot of shoes that are broken and 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 that are run down, and that people have had you know really hard scrabble lives. My father-in-law was a newspaper boy, one of thirteen children on the streets of Boston. And they would stick cardboard in the bottoms of their shoes in the winter because to insulate from the cold radiating up from the street and the cobblestones. So all the people that I talk with in hospice and nursing homes and, you know, when I, whenever I go anywhere with these books, they, they, they focus, they immediately, um, you know, they, they home in on those shoes. And I just think that's so elemental too, because it's saying that like, I, I had it hard or aren't those shoes beautiful? I wish I had shoes like that. Or I did have shoes like that. I had button up shoes and I thought I was fancy. And, um, I, you know, we would get new shoes, um, at Easter every year and they'd have to last us to the following Easter. So again, that's how these stories begin. And again, all you need to do is kind of have these visual cues and, you know, the prompting, as I said, uh, comes right from the text and, you know, which is large font and large print, 
uh, excuse me, and you know, not like a sans serif, very simple print. So they've got the visual cues with the images. They've got the words. You can read it aloud. Sometimes they can independently read these things. Um, or somebody that's a staffer, let's say somebody that's new to the building um, can come in and read with them or a grandchild, you know, the intergenerational combination, I think is fantastic. They can talk to you about like Jean, Jean Lee said to me on a podcast, she said, this is going to help people connect over things that are parts of a dying, like they're dying within our culture. So some of these rituals and some of these holidays and some of these, um, you know, things to do with, let's say, World War One, World War II, uh, the, the beginning of all of the different, let's say, eras that had to do with, um, you know, music and just, you know, the World's Fair and all these things. These are things we could talk about with, with our grandchildren, right? But given, you know, the visuals and the auditory cueing, you can do that. But without that, it's very hard to get someone back to that space where through time slips, they, they need to be like, they, they, that's where they function best because their short-term memory, you know, is compromised. And this is a place, Jen, that they can feel successful. Oh, I believe it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think wonderful divorce was like, I, I tried the bring the old family photo album and, you know, reminisce with your person with the old, old family photos. Now I'm one of two. I'm blonde. And you would, and my sister is brunette with dark brown eyes and olive skin. I mentioned earlier, I'm super pale. You would not know we are related. You would not right. see the family resemblance unless we um, point it out. Right. Because it's not in your face. Like, uh, it's not on our face, in your face. Right, right. And I was a little bit shocked. This was really early on when mom was in the memory care and I was doing everything I could to try to have positive, engaging visits and right. failing miserably, which is why this podcast got started. But I, my sister had made a scrapbook of pictures of the two of us as we were kids. So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, so I'd be, you know, I would, I would not quiz her, although a little bit of quizzing, which I now know is not great, but I was really shocked that she had zero connection to the fact that these were her kids. Right. Right. It like, and it was, devastating. yeah. Yeah, it, it was it was really hard. It was it was de it was I'm not sure devastating, but it was was definitely a downer. Right. And I right. think with your books, you're you're basically divorcing the memories that like I have. Like this is me. Why can't you recognize this is me at you know five years old or I was probably older because my sister's four and a half years younger than me. Right. You know, and and I was it just the the one time that I was able to do that, I brought my wedding album it was it happened to be on my my actual anniversary and we i just had her look through that she didn't recognize herself she didn't recognize me although i lost a tremendous amount of weight so that wasn't surprising she mm -hmm. didn't recognize her parents I, it was just like right right it was and i expected that so it wasn't problematic but it was kind of nice because we shared the some of the memories with some of the staff who were looking over her shoulder and I got married in 89. So they were kind of laughing at the big poofy dress, which was pink. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I like your books because to me, they're simpler and you're not, you're not <clears throat> attaching your memories to stuff. Well, that's not quite right. There's not a history that you have with that particular image right. or poetry. Exactly. Exactly. That was a long-winded way of basically saying that. No, but, but so that that's true. That's exactly what it's about. So the you hit the nail right on the head. It's like if there was trauma or if there were, you know, um issues though that that can be difficult, let's say within a family. Um, or if let's say, like you were saying, you feel forgotten or your your person does and it removes the pressure completely from them and from you, and you don't have that that sadness or that feel of that feeling of uh, loss and, and it's profound. And that's something that you can't really deal with in that moment because you're trying to facilitate a visit and to, to make a positive interaction. So it kind of takes that away by ha you, all these cultural icons and these iconic moments in history and uh, you know, just the beautiful things outside your window and, you know, the Robin that's building its nest in the eaves on your barn or, you know, the comings and goings of, you know, uh, you know, your children on the way off to, you know, their first day of school and all these different things that, you know, the, the changing of the seasons and 
uh, the different artworks that you can say like, oh, my first boyfriend looked like that. Or, oh, I remember my neighbor, like my mother-in-law would say, she, she would talk about her neighborhood and she would talk about this one friend of hers, Pinky, that stole everyone's boyfriends. And she would go on and on about Pinky for, you know, quite some time. So again, she was rolling. Like the, once, once we'd see some of these visuals, so it's exactly right. The people can attach it to something as, you know, in their past or just in general. And it doesn't have that loaded uh, expectation or that the, the sadness or the compl- because, because that they feel like I vaguely know who that is and I should remember who that is. And the person I'm with, I can see their expression. Uh, people, you know, with dementia are still acutely aware of the interpersonal exchange. I can see that she looks disappointed in me and I should know who this person is, or is this one of my kids? I don't even know if this is one of my kids. So that for the person has to be back to what I said before, that's really devastating. So it, it again, it, it, it helps take you away in a very sweet way that you can feel good together. It, it doesn't give you that pressure because some of the theorists early on with dementia, let's say like a Tom Kitwood, he was a visionary because they say, don't ask questions, don't interrogate, make declarative statements, make observations. It's so non-threatening, it's so threatening for someone when they say, well, you remember Johnny, Johnny went to school, you know, did, you know, he went to St. John's or he did this or he did that. And you're like, I, I the person feels almost backed into a corner because they don't have the ability to recall those things. So this is much more pleasant. It's it's much more generative and joyful. And that's kind of my goal. That makes sense. I know yeah. sometimes when my my husband has a te- I first off, everybody knows totally suck with names. And um, sometimes my husband will talk about, you know, we know like multiple Steves. I'm like, which Steve? Could you just refer to them by their last name? Right. Because he'll start saying, you know, Steve, blah, 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 blah. And he's like four or five sentences into the story. And I'm like, such and such, Steve. And it's just, it's like so frustrating. Like, dude, like, let me know which one you're talking about first. Or he'll start talking about people that are like more present in his immediate life but they're right. like background noise to me. And he'll start talking about, you know, so-and-so and da 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 I'm like, who? You know, so my mind is fine. So when he starts talking about people and I'm not sure who he's talking about, it's really, it's irritating and it's frustrating. And it's just, I just kind of want him to just like, just stop. You know, just like, just go away. I don't want to hear it. I'm confused and now I'm irritated. So you can, ima- I can totally imagine how, you know, if you're interrogating and, I didn't do that with my mom with the scrapbook of my sister and I, but I did, I did like try to ask like leading questions because I thought that was okay. But I had a huge learning curve when after my dad died and it was hard and there was less things available. Sorry, I'm bumping the mic, you know, five or six years ago than there are now. So that's, that's a positive thing, but yes. I'm, I'm excited to see the puppy. Don't mind the puppy in my purse. Cause one, oh, never I love mind the, the puppy, right? Never mind the puppy in my purse. Right. Yeah. Cause yeah. that's like, I'll send one. yeah, that's just, that's just like totally me. I've had dogs all my life. Oh, shocker. There's that story. again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, I did want to ask one quick question before I let you go. So you're, I've seen some of the pictures when we were talking before and you know, you're, you talked about, you know, representing the LGBTQ community and all the diversity that's in your photos. And these are, you know, like for lack of a better term, vintage and antique photos are historical. Where do you find all of these? Because I'm fascinated that you're finding images that are diverse. Cause I know you have children of color in the one with the dolls, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. probably in other books too, but that's as far back as my memory is going right now. (laughs) Right. Right. So it's a real challenge. Um, my focus, my background is in um, teaching, but also, um, and also at the young, young level. So I'm very familiar with bringing people into the process of, you know, under the whole language umbrella and learning how to, you know, reading and writing, speaking is all connected. It's part of human uh, connection and human uh, community being part of the human community. Um, but secondly, I worked in as a grant writer for underserved populations. So my passion really in many ways is to get good materials and I work to get better curriculum and, uh, you know, 
programming into urban and priority schools. I did that for a short period of time. But what that taught me was that it cropped up with dementia is that often the most underserved populations are the most overrepresented and have, you know, real challenges to getting care. So there's disparity in, in, um, you know, care. And that is something that I thought I really need to address that. And it was very organic. I started, um, I had somebody visiting who had a, a veteran out in the car and I brought out the life's journeys book, my first book. And that when he left that afternoon, I thought there's nothing like this for him. So I put together three different books for veterans. Um, one is the nostalgic poetry, one is Psalms for Veterans, and the other one is more of just a true straight up picture book. Um, but to your point about the images, I go far and wide. I get cabinet cards and daguerreotypes and photographs and found photographs. My most recent uh, find was, I couldn't believe that male images of same sex couples were, they were missing. I couldn't figure it. So I saw, found a few and I figured out who owns these. I have to get to the bottom of who owns these because for every image I need to have, you know, the attribution and sometimes they're found. So there is, you know, it's, it's all, you know, the photographer is unknown um, and the subject is unknown, but I do that. I use lots of art too, and lots of illustration. But in this case, I found this couple in New York city, created a book called Loving. It's hugely successful. It's a coffee table book and it's same sex couples, males. And um, it is just, they, they also, this couple, they were instrumental in putting together a an LGBTQ museum in New York City. So I reached out to um, one of the men and I said, listen, I don't want to step on any of toes. I know because of the age and, you know, uh, these images are considered to be in the public domain, but they're part of your collection. And I would like to use these particular images. I use two in the book and I, I, um, you know, attribute the images to them. And they said, you know, thank you so much for asking because most people don't even ask, they just appropriate. Um, so it, the road to get these images is a, a very, that's why the, um, never mind the puppy in my purse is taken so long. And I, I talked very briefly with, you know, um, over Instagram messenger with, you know, Patty, uh, I said, I've got something coming out for Linda and just the follow-up and getting the clearances and doing the things I need to do all in good faith. And again, um, because it's, you know, I have an on-demand printer and some of the stuff I'm doing that's digital media. Um, you know, you, it's all something that you can, modify as need be. And, you know, again, I've got to have them vetted and I have an intellectual property, you know, attorney, and it's, it, it has to be a labor of love because otherwise you wouldn't do it. Um, but that's kind of a little synopsis of where, and I love of where I get these things and I love, love, love antique, uh, illustration and things that really are, I went to a nursery school called Lily Putt and we were the Lilliputians. And I, I look back at that and think, I never really got out of that in my mind's eye. I thought that time in life and you, you know, there are these little children that are among the little bells of that look like umbrellas of the Lily of the Valley and these vistas that are just fantastical. And they look like something that you'd see in, in a storybook, the nursery rhymes and the, the images from those. I like to bring those visuals back because to read in close proximity and to be read aloud to is such a gift in life. And it's such a nurturing, warm experience that it doesn't matter your age. You're not infantilizing somebody with dementia by reading aloud to them. And anybody just wants to hear the sound of your voice, whether you're four or you're 94, you're just looking for that connection and that warmth and for someone that's going to take that time and really to help you select something that really warms your heart. It, it's it's a gift. I have a friend that I, a colleague that now is out in, um, Indiana at Butler. She um, was at IU, but she's written all kinds of books about, we were first grade teachers together. And her theory is that people learn best, children learn best, literally at, at their mother's knee or side by side with a friend or um, a, a, a loved one who is giving them their undivided attention and that can talk something through with you right in that moment. That's a gift of a lifetime. And that has truly been proven scientifically and, you know, through uh, education to, you know, 
educational theory, that is how we learn and that is how we grow and that is how we thrive. To give someone with dementia back their the love and the language, and these books help them access that language through the prompting, that is job one. And that's how that's how we're going to thrive as caregivers and help our person thrive as well. And so when is Don't Mind the Puppy in My Purse coming out? Do we know? Um, never mind the puppy in my purse. Um, I the my only image that I'm having trouble getting the clearances for right now, wouldn't you know, is the cover image. Oh, of um, course. <laughs> and I found the image, but it's now um it's not as good, it's not as clear, and it's the um uh, the layout, uh, because I'm a, a an amateur photographer myself, um, is not as good as the one that is with a an, that's in an archive. Um, again, so sometimes I wait, sometimes I take a pass, sometimes I find something comparable. So that's really the only holdup right now. And with um, you know getting it up onto uh, you know Amazon or Ingram Spark or any of these uh, you know platforms. Or the digital, I, I work with Issue also, I-S-S-U-U. And you can get, if you let's say you liked one of my, my books, Jen, and you said, I'm going to order one of those books, but I want it as a magazine. Or I want to order one that's got a spiral binding so I can lay it flat on the desk to work with my mom. Or I want it as hardcover so I can give it as a Christmas gift. Any of those things, you can get them on Issue in any format you choose and digitally. So I can I can upload, finish uploading this to Issue tonight. You know what I'm saying? Like, or in an hour. So it's that immediate. And if there needed to be a change, let's say, um, I've never had that happen, but if there needed to be a change, um, I could do that also within an hour. So to answer your question, I could have this up and going once I have all the clearances um, tonight, but, you know, um, so that's kind of where it stands. So it should be quite soon. And as I said, the love is love, big launch um, will be May 3rd. So, and that's, that's kind of coming online and I've done nothing to promote any of the books. So if you look on Amazon or whatever, I don't really have any reviews, but if you look on my website and you can see all of the critical reviews with, you know, all of the, uh, you know, won the mods awards for, I'm so grateful for that, um, for innovation in dementia care, for making connections for 2021 and Al speaks and Al's authors and the neurocognitive community and, um, now AFA, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, I'm going to speak uh, on their broadcast um, that's going to be in September. So lots of different and um, you know people in many many different areas of dementia, the community have embraced the book. So that was job one. Now I'm I'm circling back and I'm going to get things. Uh, you know, I want I really just want to get them in the hands of people that need them. So that's what's happening next. So uh, this, and I thank you for having me, this will help me to do that because you have, you know, a large audience, a, a committed audience and people that are, you know, really in, you know, in the midst of giving this care and living this life, right? Mm-hmm. It's the more tools we have, the better. And more of us are going to need more tools. We just, it's going to, Society is going to need them. Caregivers are going to need them. We all need, and they're coming. Thank goodness. We just, there's right. a lot of, there's the population is aging and we're not keeping up with what those needs are going to be. So I love talking to people like you that are helping fill some of those needs because, you know, everybody's different. We all need different tools and different prompts and all that kind of good stuff. Right. But if you need a, a picture of a young blonde child in oversized roller skates holding a puppy by its chest. I have it for you. <laughs> well, send it my way because as I said, I can do things. And the very first image in my book is a friend, as I said, she's 87 and she was in Waterbury, Connecticut. And, um, I'm, she's been a mentor to me. So I made her picture the, um, hugging her doll, the first image in the book. So Jen, I can certainly add you if it's okay. high, re high resolution, honey, send it to me. I could probably make it as high resolution as possible, but I could picture it. I'm not sure how super clear the original is, but I'll look at it. It's got to be in the, it might actually already be digital because we, before we moved, we spent quite a sum of money having all the family photos, slides, um, you know, V8, the, the videotapes, et cetera, all converted to digital. So 
I'm no, sure it's, I, I know it's around, but I appreciate this. I'm looking forward to seeing that book and um, the love is loving. Loving is love. Oh, love is love. Yes. Love is love. Okay. And nostalgic poetry. Yes. Um, yeah. That sounds that, awesome too. That's on Amazon now. And again, net, starting, you know, again, you can go on the issue platform and four of the books um, of the 25 are loaded to issue right now. So you could pull those up today. Um, the remainder of the other, you know, the balance of the books, all 25 are available now on Amazon. And then I'm going to, um, starting early summer, going to have the books on, you know, all the different platforms, you know, you could get them in Barnes and Noble or, or Target or whatever. But again, I need it because you cannot write on the book anywhere that the book is for Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, I, because that's not good for the people that are living with Alzheimer's or dementia. It's demeaning and it's, you know, um, it, it's not something that is a feel good for them. It's hard to shelve them. It's hard to, so I needed to get these types of approvals. I even have a QR code now that people, because of COVID and you go to a restaurant, you can scan a QR code. They can scan the QR code on the back of my book and learn all about the books and you know what the series is about and what how you use these books and who these books are for. So I kind of had to work backwards, um, build the collection. And now, you know, now that it's receiving these, um, you know, these supportive messages and, and uh, these approvals and so forth, I can get them to a broader audience and can get them in, out to the mass market. So I'm working backwards, but I would say by early summer, you'll be able to get them pretty much anywhere. So that's why I'm right now not great at it, but I'm learning how to promote. The PT Barnum is not in me. I have to learn how to promote <laughs> things. Uh, I love to make the books. I love to spend time with people that are living with dementia and with caregivers like you. But the promotion is something that I've got to get going with. And I, I, well, I, hope, I hope, sorry. I don't know if you can hear the dogs barking, but something wound them up. But I hope I can help um, promote the books. Thank you. I think when the, when the puppy one comes out, I'm going to do a giveaway. So I will grab one of those. And oh, I'm going to, okay. I will um, link the issue website in the show notes so people can get exactly what it is that they need. Cause wow, choices are nice, hardbound, spiral bound, digital. Yeah. I'm all for that. You know? So that's awesome. And I guess the dog barking in the background is kind of apropos, yeah. but definitely check these out. They're really, really cool. Um, we didn't show any on the zoom call. So, you know, you don't have to rush over to YouTube and check it out, but definitely go check out her website and I thank you, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing more of them. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Appreciate being here, and appreciate all of your support. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.